Good morning, everyone. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us for an hour this morning to hear ideas on return to office and hybrid work strategies. I'm Ann Gowan, Director of Client Engagement at POI, and believe that just as chefs create recipes for their unique dishes by selecting ingredients, companies are challenged with choosing the right ingredients to create their own flavor of hybrid for their organizations and their people. Discussions, surveys, and statistics around the changing nature of work, worker, and the workplace is not a new phenomenon. In the mid 2000s, we started seeing a shift from one person, one seat, to one to two and one to three ratios for workspace accommodations. Workplaces started becoming more open with an increase in collaboration spaces to facilitate teamwork. And we also saw the rise in social spaces. In 2019, the term Generation Flex was coined and business leaders began to acknowledge the benefits achieved by early adopters who claimed their businesses were more productive by a whopping 85% through a flexible work environment. History has taught us with any world crisis comes a seismic shift in how we live and how we work, even how we learn. This world crisis is no different. The pandemic propelled us into generation flex. No matter your age or stage within your working career, you were generation flex or are generation flex. Most recently, Angus Reid conducted a survey of 1,509 employed Canadians about their workplace preferences. The majority, 39%, indicated that they would prefer a hybrid work model. Equally, an average of 29% stated they would look for another job, while 34% of those between the ages of 25 and 44 stated they would look for another place of employment should the hybrid model not, not hybrid model not be adopted within their workspace workplace? Big numbers. With the war for talent and engagement being one of the biggest concerns of business leaders, we all need to pay attention. The many benefits of hybrid work have been espoused over the past 16 plus months through media, online meetings, and the virtual water cooler chats. There are many challenges as organizations develop their recipe, such as the provision of a conducive workplace and workspace, as well as the appropriate technology to get work done. Before I introduce our panelists, a little housekeeping. We encourage questions from our audience. Please post them in our chat and our panelists will address as many as possible towards the end of our time together today. Any questions that we don't get to will be placed in an FAQ document and distributed to our attendees. I now have the pleasure of introducing our panelists today. Dr. Tracy Brower is a sociologist and author of two books, The Secrets to Happiness at Work and Bring Work to Life by Bringing Life to Work. Tracy studies how people and companies can create fulfillment, meaning, and vitality in their work. She is a regular contributor to Forbes.com and Fast Company, as well as being principal with the Applied Research and Consulting Group at Steelcase. That is one busy woman. Fatima McIntosh Nickel is a workplace design strategist at POI. She brings together her vast amount of experience and knowledge of the workplace and transforms it into high performance design solutions through a deep understanding of people, place and process. She has a curious mind and a gleam in her eye, always present. I have the privilege of working with Fatima to solve complex problems of the workplace through applications for our clients and influencers. Rich Benoit is a workplace consultant with the Applied Research and Consulting Team at Steelcase. 
Rich studies and researches the interrelationship between work, worker, and the workplace. He has led a multitude of change management engagements with our clients by understanding their unique challenges and applies his ability to uncover latent requirements through a masterful use of various tools he has helped to create with his team. As published in the Globe and Mail on July 8th, our client, Sun Life Financial, announced their plans to return to the office and hybrid work. While not divesting themselves of real estate, employees are not required to work from the office for a minimum or a maximum number of days in the week. Rather, using client and business needs as guides, employees will choose where they work at any given time based upon the activities they need to complete their work. So let's begin. The power of hybrid. I'll ask Tracy to start us off. Over to you, Tracy. You're on a mute, Tracy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anne. I appreciate it. And we are thrilled to uh, get together today and have this conversation about this topic in these days. You know, we've been saying that this is going to be a reinvention of work, but it is also a reinvention, a reset and a reimagination based on the talent revolution. And you emphasize this, Anne, but there's also some global research that suggests that 40% of people globally are planning to leave their current employers. And 29% of senior executives are saying globally they need to increase their headcounts. So this will absolutely be a talent revolution. And that is part of what makes the work experience so especially important. You know, things in the future of work will be faster. They will also be more ambiguous as we have been fundamentally disrupted in our work, in the way that we work, in where we work, in with whom we work. We are thinking really consciously about all of those things and making choices based on work experiences. And as we go faster and as things are more complex and more ambiguous, that work experience will be even more important in terms of uniting us, in terms of creating community, in terms of attracting and retaining, but also in terms of engaging and in terms of developing. People will be open to a greater extent. You know, a lot of the technology uh, that we anticipate in the future has been on the horizon, but with such, such disruption, we tend to be more open and we tend to be um, thinking in new ways about the way that we can adapt to the technology and the technology can adapt to us. That will apply to workplace as well in terms of the new openness to new ways of working. We anticipate more flexibility and choice. We're also seeing a trend in the future of work where things will be more holistic. Um, companies are meeting employees where they are in terms of their desire for choice and flexibility. Um, we're looking at employees in a very holistic way in terms of their well-being their physical, their cognitive, their emotional well-being, and how the work experience is part of that. And we are seeing more people-centered practices. We can go to the next slide. And the leadership implications for how leaders lead, how they engage people, how they motivate people, and how they create a culture of trust and inclusivity. So the future will be hybrid. The future will be a different way of working, and that is an opportunity for all of us. We can go to the next slide. This is really interesting times because people have high expectations. Their expectations have been reset about how they work and where they work. And we know that creating happiness for them is a big deal. One of the things that we know is when people are happy, they tend to be more physically healthy and more mentally healthy, statistically speaking. And that is good for companies. It's also good for people. When people are happier, they also tend to make better decisions. They perform better in their job. They tend to set bigger goals and be more focused on continuous learning and stretch and motivated to try new things. 
They are also, when they are happier, more likely to stick with their current employer, and they tend to be more likable. They tend to be kind of magnetic, people that others want to work with, people who are contributing to a positive culture and a positive experience um, at work and in the culture overall. The other really interesting thing is that there's some wonderful data about happiness and country level outcomes. When countries have happier citizens, they tend to see greater GDP, they tend to see greater educational attainment and greater health and longevity from a physical standpoint. So the reasons to create a great work experience have everything to do with creating the conditions for people to be both happy and engaged, motivated, and performing really well in a way that feels good to them in terms of their esteem and that pays off for companies. And we can go to the next slide. Another thing that's important to be aware of is that place has everything to do with this equation. We know there's a lot that contributes to a really holistic work experience. It is about culture. It is about process. It is about tools and technology and enabling the workforce. It is also about space. And so it's holistic and we can think about how those things come together and start to be manifest in space. In particular, places that give people the opportunity for community are a big deal. We humans are utterly social and uh, work is a fundamentally um, a fundamental way that we create and fulfill those needs for our social desires. This isn't about making everybody an extrovert. People are both introverts and extroverts. They have needs that are different in terms of um, in terms of how much they need to be with other people. But we know statistically when people feel more connected, when they feel part of a community, when they feel a level of belonging, they actually have positive neurotransmitters that are released and that helps them to not only feel better, but also be better and bring their best to the work environment. And so places that create community and connection are a very big deal. It's also a very big deal when places provide opportunity for access to leaders. Statistically, in our Steelcase uh, research, we found that when leaders are more present and accessible, people experience greater levels of community and we see greater effects in terms of retention, commitment, performance, and engagement. And those are a big deal. You know, we often have this conversation in our industry about where we should invest in the physical experience and where it will really pay off. And we know that leadership presence and accessibility is a place where it plays off. Another place that it pays off is in terms of stimulation and inspiration. You know, we know there are pros and cons to remote work. We know there are pros and cons to working at home or working away from the office and pros and cons of being in the office. One of the pros of being in the office is the stimulation and inspiration that can occur there. Our worlds have gotten smaller in the last 18 months. We may love to be in our fuzzy slippers, but it can be limiting. And so people are saying in our studies, they want stimulation and inspiration that comes from being in a different place, from the variety of places, from coming together with their colleagues. And that is a very big deal. Variety is one of those things that will draw people in and keep them coming back. Performance is a big deal too. People want to perform well. They want to feel like they have opportunities for focus and collaboration and learning and socializing and rejuvenating. And we may need those in different proportions in the office going forward, but we will need all of them as part of the office experience for sure. And we'll need well-being. We talked about it becoming more central, becoming more strategic as we focus on people holistically and as that is an important part of attraction and retention. So places that support that will be important. And you know, this is really interesting. Learning, stretch, challenge are very big motivators. They drive things like happiness and engagement and attraction and retention. When we are sweating, either literally or figuratively, it is a good thing because it engages us. It brings up our capabilities and it brings up our opportunity to um, contribute along with our team and roll up sleeves and create those relationships through task.
So these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about, the kinds of things we know are going to be so important in the hybrid experience. But Fatima is going to talk a little bit about how this has been manifest with POI and how you all are starting to see the payoffs of some of these things. So over to you, Fatima. Thank you, Tracy. As a workplace design strategist, I have had the opportunity to work closely with several large organizations over the past year and a half to help them prepare for their return to the office and our new ecosystem. What I have learned is that there's not a one size fits all approach and or a silver bullet as we navigate hybrid work. Like many of our clients, the POI hybrid work model is under development. As we embark upon this journey, we are embracing the trial of new ways of working through the creation of a flexible work environment that is inclusive of the work, the worker, and the workplace. Our organization, like most of yours, is comprised of many functional groups from sales and marketing, workplace and application consultants, project management, operations, and finance. While many of these roles naturally lend themselves to a more transient style of working, others prior to the pandemic were full-time team members in the office. The challenge for all of us is to create equity within our hybrid work model, a big change for all organizations. POI's hybrid work policy will clearly communicate individual and company responsibilities that are inherent to our new ways of working to ensure equity and transparency. After analyzing several business models to incorporate hybrid, our leadership team concluded that mandating specific days within the office, just like Sun Life, was not the right approach for our culture. Instead, our lens is focused on choice choice of where our team members need to be to work and how that choice impacts our business. So let's take a deeper dive into what this means for us. When considering where to work on any particular day, we are empowering our employees to ask themselves what impact the choice they make has on their job, their team and client engagement. That choice can be anywhere in our ecosystem, a client site, a coffee shop, at home, or anywhere else, not just in our office. And that choice is not going to be the same for every individual in, or even two people in the, that hold a similar role. Several factors will influence that decision. We know that varied work from home experiences have shaped employee expectations, and what hybrid looks like for each individual will be unique. Therefore, engaging in constant communication with our people to help them embrace our culture and our hybrid framework is essential. Equally important is creating a performance-based management of our people. Just the way we work has changed, the way we lead or manage our teams is changing. Shifting from presenteeism to performance-based management is key. Providing our managers with a robust with robust performance management guidelines and resources to manage a hybrid team that supports ongoing engagement is essential to the success of our hybrid model, thereby enabling our team leaders to assist individuals in determining what does hybrid look like for them and make those decisions based upon their impact to our business, their work, their team, and our customers. We know that work can happen anywhere. Therefore, these choices are not determined solely by any physical space. It is about making a choice about where they need to be to be successful. One of those places to be successful is our workplace. Just prior to the pandemic, we had made the decision to move POI headquarters and started the planning process. We became our own clients and with the assistance of our partner Steelcase, facilitated an evidence of success workshop with our leadership team. The central question we posed to our team was, in a year from now, what would you like to look back on and say, wow, that was successful? The outcome was four key organizational goals around brand, well-being, innovation, and technology, and the guiding principles for our new design, for our, the design for our new experience center were born. Our center is where our teams come together as a community, where we live our brand, where we will test, modify and evolve as we embark on our hybrid journey. With the onset of the pandemic, we, we held subsequent physically distanced workshops with our functional team members. 
where we explored the new ecosystem of spaces that included working from home. Three key workplace considerations were identified in these workshops. You can see them listed here, personal storage, ease of use technology, and height adjustability. The work cafe was a key area highlighted, highlighted by our team as a vital place for us to build culture and expand our community. Combining the workshop research and deeper additional dive discovery sessions with each functional group, we began developing the plans for our new space. Here are just a few examples of how those spaces have manifested through our planning. We listened. It was important that the work cafe be located within an easily accessible central location, a space that you can flow through throughout the day and bump into colleagues and our customers, a social hub where you can break bread and build and strengthen that important social capital that we've been hearing so much about over the past year, with dining spaces closest to the food prep area and dining workspaces stretching into our front porch we have created an ombre of work modes available to support various activities throughout the entire workday. Well-being is key. Exposure to natural light and access to outdoors is a coveted asset. To support the well-being of our people, we took advantage of the available outdoor space and extended the space to create a patio. With a hybrid workforce, we know that building and maintaining culture and fostering employee engagement is challenging. How do I make an imprint on my space without my personal artifacts, my name on my desk, or my achievements posted on the wall? How do I feel as though I am part of who we are and what we do? Creating connection not only to each other, but to the organization is essential to our employees feeling engaged. To a technology enabled communication hub will give us 24 hour access to our vital operations team located at our distribution center, a wormhole to steel case work life, and the ability to map our trucks to visually illustrate ongoing installations with our clients and connect us to our team members in the field. Most importantly, this wall will tell the story of our people, celebrating individual team members and their successes, our client stories and our history, the legacy that got us to where we are today. There are no better spaces that exemplify designing with a new perspective, an understanding of evolved work styles, and the new workplace ecosystem as our neighborhoods. The objective of the new neighborhoods is to reignite our culture and community when we return to the office and strengthen trust amongst our cross-functional teams, all while addressing the macro shifts of safety, productivity, inspiration, and flexibility. These dynamic neighborhoods are made up of, as you can see, open and shielded focus spaces, as well as team collaborative spaces, giving individuals and teams choice and control over where to focus, learn, collaborate, or rejuvenate while being safe and feeling safe. Our people can choose the best place to do their best work, providing them with a seamless transition in a hybrid work environment. As Tracy mentioned, Variety contributes effectively to a more interesting experience, which, which draws us in and keeps us coming back. We look forward to you joining us again in the fall for our next webinar. We will be walking you through our entire space when construction is complete and we have returned. We will share our lessons learned, course corrections, and an evolving hybrid model. We are prepared and have designed a space that will evolve with us. Back in February, I think it was lockdown number one or two, who's counting? I had the fortunate experience to listen in on a presentation by a group of young bright minds at Gensler who shared their ideas on how the way we design buildings to support the shifting paradigms of our work, as well as the shifting paradigms of our retail industry. Their optimism and hopefulness for what is to come and the possibilities were infectious. They reminded me that the greatest challenges that we have collectively faced have fueled the greatest periods of growth and accelerated innovation throughout history. They referenced the roaring 20s that followed the 1918 influenza pandemic, and we're looking forward to this century's roaring 20s. Are we there yet? Perhaps not quite, but we are certainly on our way. And with that, 
to share with us the learnings of an organization that is further along the way, I will hand the discussion over to our next panelist, Rich Benoit, who will share with us Steelcase's return to the office. We understand that there are a number of organizations that are in the race to be last because they want to see what everyone else is doing. Steelcase is one of those organizations that are in the race to be first, to give them, a to give them time to learn and evolve and send the right message to both their employees and customers about embracing and moving forward in our new reality. Over to you, Rich. Great, thanks Fatima. Um, and yes, we're in the race. I'm not sure we'll be first, but we're absolutely in the race. And um, you know, the thing that we have um, really acknowledged, like 96% of organizations, is that the, the paradigm of the office needs to change. So, you know, there was actually a question in the chat about, you know, does high, what is hybrid, you know, what's the definition of hybrid? Um, hybrid just means you've changed your strategy. I mean, and it, it is going to mean something different for every organization, which is why, you know, the race to be last, whatever it is, benchmarking can be really challenging because, and, and even Ian brought up the statistic around, you know, the, 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 you know, um, percentage of people that are looking for hybrid work. What people have always wanted was flexibility. And Tracy talks a lot about this even in her first book, um, you know, about the need for people to, to really have the autonomy, uh, to have the trust of the organization to do their best work. And so, you know, I think what happened is when everybody went home to work, companies had to realize that work still got done when people were at home. So the excuse of you need to be in the office because we need to see you working no longer holds any weight. Um, you know, somebody said the genie's out of the bottle. That's not, you know, to tell people you have to be in to get your work done doesn't really, it, it, it's not necessarily true. So companies have acknowledged that there is incredible value in giving people more autonomy. And I, we can even go back to Daniel Pink's book, Drive, where the number one motivator for knowledge workers is autonomy, not money. And so um, there's a ton of research that really backs this up, but so that now everybody's proved that point. And so, you know, companies are sort of now challenged with how do we create this hybrid experience? So we can talk a little bit about how we move forward. So um, in the next slide, one of the things that McKinsey, you know, identified um, was the number of, um, you know, organizations that are still thinking about it. So when we think about that race to be first or race to be last, Lots of companies are sort of really struggling with well, what does this really mean? And we look at only 11% of companies really have a strategy that they've started to implement. You know, a number of others have kind of got a vision of what it would look like, but the vast majority are really stuck. And on one case, it's how do we create an equitable opportunity around, you know, who comes to work and who doesn't? And that's not really that's really never going to work because there are some some roles that are site specific. You have, you know, at Steelcase, the people who work in our model shop and our test lab kind of have to do that in the office. That doesn't really work from home. And so, you know, we really, you know, companies really need to sort of step back and think about what is it that drives, you know, drives their business. And like, you know, when Fatima talked about what drives POIs performance and recognizing that, you know, you know, even compare it to Sun Life, um, you know, they're very different organizations, but they're taking a very thoughtful approach to what do, what does their, what does it mean to their business? And so that um, if we go to the next slide, the guidelines that we've been using on ourselves and in conversations with lots of or lots of other companies is first establishing what does the organization need to prosper and it's looking at you know there are certain roles that have to be on done on site so you have to have people there but then why do you want to have people there and creating a sense of belonging that connection to the purpose of the organization um, how do you mentor 
um, new talent. How do you help those really ambitious, you know, that, that that ambitious young person who really wants to have that connection? And so they really want, you know, to they really want to be seen um, in order to, you know, move themselves through those, you know, through their career. You know, Tracy talked a lot about, you know, um, uh, you know, happiness at work. And lots of people get, you know, a lot of fulfillment by being successful in their roles. And a lot of that, you know, isolation really doesn't help a lot. So we really need the organization to kind of take a, a firm stand on kind of almost like what's the minimum viable level of presence, um, you know, because we saw when companies sent people, you know, home to work remotely that that was kind of a disaster. The second piece is understanding how teams actually succeed together. So there's, you know, certainly um, roles where the interdependence of working together is far more critical than other roles that might be more around individual contribution. And so this again gets into the sense of equity around what is going to make what is going to make the business successful based on the way people work. And then the third piece is the individual sentiment. So, you know, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, Tracy talked a little bit about, you know, it's like, how do you know what makes people happy if you don't ask them? So in our process of moving forward, we took the time to ask our, our employees about their expectations for the future. Because if you don't know what they are, um, you have this huge gap. And so you may be going off in one direction thinking, this is gonna be great for everyone, but if you really actually don't understand what they're thinking, um, you know, the chances of aligning um, really become sort of a, you know, not necessarily, uh, the odds for that are, are, are not all that great. So if we go to the next slide, one of the things that we think that is really important, and this is just the idea of profiling the organization, and we took some time to do this. And, you know, you know, lots of, you know, lots of research is pointing to this idea that you will have people in different sort of categories. And, you know, not that we want to create some, um, you know, put labels on people. That's not the intent of this. But if we're trying to think about pl a planful and intentional workplace, it's really helpful to understand who's coming in at what kind of cadence, and of course, why are they coming in? So when you look at some of the real estate models where, well, you're gonna have a hybrid workforce and some percentage is gonna come in two to three days a week. Well, that's fine. Why are they there? Um, and so what we start to look at, and again, these were just examples that came out of our research, is there, you know, people that are going to come to the office randomly? So, um, you know, Fatima talked about, you know, the salespeople might be out with clients. My role as a consultant is, to, you know, to be in the field. I go into the office when I need to, um, and it's there for meetings. It's there to connect with people, or there, or even to just keep my network up. So I would want to be there to socialize. There are people uh, who are going to see the home office as far more valuable than the than the workplace. And they're, you know, independent contributors, they're technologically enabled, their work is very somewhat regimented and measured, and they're perfectly happy working from home and that's where they're going to do their best work. We have other people that are coming into the office because either they love the social energy of what's going on or they really need to collaborate to drive new ideas. And then we still may have a percentage of people that just like to come to the office because they like that separation between work life and home life. Or, you know, that's this is their sort of their social outlet or they live in a rural area where they have really crappy bandwidth and so they can't actually do a Teams meeting most of the time. Everyone's work from home experience has been different. So the idea of building some empathy around what people really need, and again, asking them is really critical to making sure that we're aligning with their expectations. So um, if we go to the next slide, we can show you a floor plan overview of our first endeavor into what we refer to as a, as a work better installation and what we've done is created a series of neighborhoods for uh, for the different teams that are here and each neighborhood is intended to be sort of 
as not just a, a sort of a, a somewhat of a self-contained element where all we're supporting all of the work modes, but we also are create trying to create a sense of community across the floor. All of the teams here support our sales process behind the curtain. So they all have this, this sort of this interconnection. But prior to this, it wasn't all that visible. And we wanted to create a space that really supported a lot of learning. So, you know, we you know, Tracy really brought that up. We, we wanted people to think of this as a place to grow in the organization and how we can learn, you know, how, how teams can actually learn from each other and really drive that, that sense of um, a, a culture of learning, not just sharing. People are really helpful to have, you know, to, you know, somebody's got a question to help each other out, but we wanted to make it more pervasive and more, in, more um, overt. So um, if we go to the next slide, you can start to see how um, we created workstations that almost, are, you know, some people like it's a little bit of a throwback. But when we think about performance and productivity, what we what we understood from really diving into understanding the work process is that people have these really some of these people have these really um, incredible rhythms of going in and out of their work modes. They go from I'm on the phone to I need to focus on something to I have a question. I'm working on something with somebody else. But when I'm at my desk, I have to balance accessibility and privacy. So we have screens that allow people to give them, you know, if I need to, if I need to not be interrupted, I can put the screen in place. Um, I may, I have the adjustability with the height, you know, the height adjustable desk and the um, screens, the dual monitors, and so I have the ability to be productive. Because one of the things that we heard was if I'm more comfortable and productive at home because I have more acoustical privacy or more visual privacy, or I have the tools that I need, I have to have that at work if I'm gonna come in and be productive. So we, um, the other thing that we provided here is that the workstations are, are, are affordances for the work process, not attendance. So some of the teams all have assigned seats because they're expected to be in the office most of the time. We have other teams where we might have, you know, a, a two to one sharing ratio. All the workstations are identical because we didn't want to compromise the work process just because you only come in one or two days a week. Um, this idea that, well, if you're only in infrequently, you just need a place to touch down. And that's not how these people work. If I'm in the office, I still need access to all of the tools that I need to be productive. So, you know, so whether it's an assigned seat, which might have a little bit more personal storage, or it's unassigned, the dual monitors, the height adjustable desk, um, the um, comfortable chair, the uh, 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 flexible privacy are all available to anybody working in the space. If we go to the next slide, we also increase the levels of the afford the accessibility to privacy and confidentiality. So we've tried to manage the noise. One of the things that we heard from people um, is when you're at home, having a confidential conversation is pretty simple because you're pretty much by yourself. Um, and so the nature of some of these uh, of some of these roles are having um, you know com uh, conversations that are you know should be limited and so we put in a number of these focus pods across the floor and they have been incredibly popular so we have a, a ridiculous ratio and people still want more of them and what's been really nice to see is the ver that people are not squatting in them because that's always one of the concerns is, well, if we give these people, if we put these private spaces, are people going to just, you know, stay in them indefinitely? And I've walked by this space. We've been in there for about two months now and they are used very frequently and they're always different people. So some of them like here are set up to be a little bit, um, you know, so if I'm leading a team's call and I'm going to be making a lot of noise, I can go in there and shut the door and not disturb, you know, people around me. Or, you know, if I'm doing something confidential, I can come in and, and have, um, you know, have that quick phone call. These are not reservable. So if I pick up the phone and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need to talk about something, I can easily see through the glass that the space is available. So it, again, it helps with that temporal rhythm of letting people simply get up and move. 
And then on the next slide, one of the things that we also incorporated were these open collaboration spaces that we call front porches. And each team has a front porch. So one of the characteristics around creating a sense of residency is creating an identity for each of the teams. So if I maybe I don't own a seat, but I own a space. And so this idea of having this communal integration of we're all kind of, you know, working here together allows the teams to, you know, keep information about the team that's there. It's a place for um, social connections and network building. It's a place to take the noise again away from the workstation into these areas that become a buffer between the circulation and the um and you know in the in the work zones and what's kind of interesting is uh the photo on the left in one of those spaces we've got sort of this casual setting with that boundary behind it and we've got some of those tall tables behind it and it's not uncommon to see two groups at either space and one of the characteristics that we find is business conversations are not necessarily invasive when people talk complain about the noise it's usually the social chit chat that's going on and people are walking by. But more than, you know, it's actually fairly often that I've seen two conversations happening simultaneously. And, you know, when you think about in the corporate environment, well, that would never happen. But if you think about going to the coffee shop or a restaurant, there are multiple conversations going around constantly. And, but I think that one of the things that we've learned through the re through previous research is that boundary behind that sofa is just enough to kind of give people that separation and that shielding. It's not acoustic at all, but you create these two sort of settings that allow people to, you know, again, it's that behavior change and people are starting to get really comfortable with it, um, which is a great way for knowledge sharing. Because now you can overhear those conversations, uh, which again sort of promotes this sense of learning throughout the organization. And then the last couple of slides um, around um, how important we felt well being. And so Tracy really alluded to this. You know, we want to give people choices, we want to create pay spaces that are inspiring. And today, if you're working from home, you know, maybe you can go out to your deck or sit in your front porch, or maybe you've got a balcony on your apartment. But creating spaces that are, are really a refuge in the workplace. So they're very in de institutionalized. And one of the things we're experimenting with on the photo on the left in this big canopy that overlays the, uh, the sofa. And it's just enough shielding that people feel like they're not on display. Obviously, it's not acoustic and it's not, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's for to this translucent kind of material, but it gives this cocoon like sensibility where people can kind of go and you know, we've seen you know a couple of people having a conversation. I've seen people there sitting and working, but some of these jobs are relatively stressful. And so being able to go somewhere to kind of decompress, to just simply work by themselves, but to give those affordances of what it would be like working from home. And so by giving that sort of that variety that Tracy talked about, um, to be able to have um, those different elements that make them feel you know, far more personal when you think about the materials that are in there, the textures, the biophilia. And then um, the last thing that I wanted to end with was we took this idea of working outside, you know, literally. And so we actually um, just opened up a work patio right outside the door from this space. So it's enabled with power and Wi-Fi and canopies and soft seating and you know uh, conference tables and meeting spaces. And the conference table is actually reservable. So if you want to schedule that space for your meeting, you can absolutely do that. But we we heard from a number of people just how, you know, the fact that, you know, just access to outdoors and especially in Michigan, much like, you know, in, in your in your part of the world, you know, we have a limited time frame. So we're going to see how long we can keep this up. But it really provides this, this you know, we talk about variety. This really, really accommodates a number of, you know, um, you know how, how people really just want to be able to work wherever they can do their best work. So we took this, again, this idea of well-being really literally um, in giving people the spaces 
that that they can relate to. Um, and again, by through this whole process of understanding the user expectations, as well as what does the organization want to accomplish and how diving in with them about how they really actually get their work done, we're all used to inform all of these settings to create this ecosystem that is really, I think, taking something um, off to the future. We're accommodating people both that are coming in every day as people who come in maybe just a couple times a week and providing for all of those, you know, all of that variability um, to be able to, you know, again, we, we want to Encourage. I mean, yes, we've gotten to where we expect people to be in the office, but this is really about encouraging people to be in the office. People would want to be here. They're not coming in because they're being told. They're coming in because this is kind of a cool place to be. So I will um, turn it over. I know that we've got some questions um, kind of probably um, that we've collected along the way. So I guess, Nicole, you're going to, um, I think, drive from here. Sure, yeah, thanks very much, Rich. Um, yeah, we do have a number of terrific questions and uh, I'm going to read out a few. And funny enough, I think this first question is going to, to see perfectly, Rich. So um, we've got a question here that says, does hybrid have to include choice? For example, if we are mandating two to three days in the office for our teams and the specific days they need to be there, do we have to actually have a hybrid model? Well, it's sort of by definition. Well, again, depending on how you define it, I think, yeah, that would that would represent a hybrid model. I think what most in the in the broadest and Tracy can probably weigh in here as well in the broadest definition of hybrid. All it means is you're not in the office eight to five, five days a week. Once you've gone, once you've kind of broken that rule. You're hybrid, so I know, Tracy, you might want to add to that. You're on mute. Yeah, I, th I agree, Rich. I think that um, hybrid is fundamentally about different people working in different places and choosing their best place for the day. But one of the things that's a true advantage of hybrid is the choice and control and autonomy that we can give people. So I think that that really is one of the benefits that we want to embrace of hybrid. And that makes such a difference for attraction and retention as well. I know there was a question that had come up on attraction and retention. And one of the things we know is that people are going to be paying close attention to how much choice they get and the ways that they can express their preferences for how they work and where they work. And so hybrid is a great way to provide that choice. It's not always required, but our experience of customers who are starting to go there and starting to learn and starting to evolve is that the choice and hybridity work really well together. Great, thanks, Tracy. You know what, um, actually, you spoke about the importance of equity and inclusion within the workplace. So I think this question came in, um, how does a company overcome the potential for haves and have nots with some people choosing to work from home and more frequently while others are going into the office? Yeah, it's a great question, right? Statistically, there's some really interesting studies that if people don't perceive fairness in their work, environment, they will be more likely to leave. So this really matters. And I think the other thing to think about is that fairness is always in the eye of the beholder. You want to do things that are really fair in terms of integrity and doing the right thing. And you need people to perceive that they're fair. And people will define that differently. You know, he gets to work from home all the time. He gets all the goodies. He gets all the flexibility. Or she gets to work in the office all the time. She gets all the goodies. She gets all the cool stuff. People will define fair in their own way, and they will define haves and have nots in their own way. I think as we work through fairness, number one is going to be principles. Like if we've got some principles that can guide the decisions that are really clear for people, that will be a big deal. Another piece will be transparency. The more people understand, the more they're likely to trust. And when they can see why we're making the decisions that we are based on a transparency of those principles and how those principles applied, that will be important. I think another thing, and Rich spoke 
spoke to this is really thinking about work process and having work processes and requirements of the way the work gets done and the way teams get their work done will be really helpful and guiding decisions that feel more fair. And then finally, creating cultures of trust bonding people, creating strong relationships among team members and among team members and their leaders, those strong relationships and an overall sense that we kind of get each other and we kind of trust each other absolutely contribute to that perception of fairness as well. Yeah, absolutely, Tracy. And you know, it's, uh, I'd say we could even add, um, there is an, a new layer emerging uh, performance management work models those types of things are going to really be important. And, and Fatima, I was wondering, could you answer this question? Uh, with so many employees being remote, what advice can we share with leaders about key insights on managing and coaching uh, a hybrid workforce long-term? Great, thank you for the, that question, Nicole. What I can say is first and foremost, what we're learning is that communication is key, followed closely by equity. I think managers need to prioritize go ongoing performance conversations more than ever. There needs to, and this needs to be done equitably across the hybrid workforce. Tracy and Anne both mentioned statistics about this talent exodus, people that are looking to leave their current employer. And that's not only because of the adoption or not adopting a hybrid model. There are other drivers. In another recent survey, I believe Canadian um, of Canadian employees they found that feelings of burnout coupled with feelings of career stagnation were drivers with 62% of respondents saying the pandemic had made them feel stuck in when it comes to career advancement. What this demonstrates is the ad hoc approach to management that we adopted as a response to the pandemic is not sustainable and it is certainly not in terms of longevity in managing a hybrid workforce. I believe that the organizations, and there are a lot of them out there that have recognized this, are preparing by training managers for remote leadership, reimagining their processes, and rethinking about how employees can be successful in their role. Just a, an example is that the of the type of re uh, required communication is setting up frequent scheduled conversations between managers and employees, really to collaboratively define what does success look like setting clear goals and expectations and showing them how what they do really affects the business. And that all ties in with engagement and equity there, where managers can no longer rely on those informal interactions, you know, the coffee chats and dropping by to see how someone's doing or and that's, you know, we know it's the human nature. That's how individuals build trust. So we really need to understand that we need to create new opportunities for com communication. And that I believe is the key as we move forward in man moving more to performance management as opposed to seeing people in the office every day. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, you know, it does. And I, and I think it's something that, um, you know, leaders really need to start to think about. Um, you know, I think we have time for one more question. So, uh, Rich, this seems to be aimed at you. Um, at, you know, since you've been testing the hybrid work model, um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced and were there any surprises that you thought were interesting? So much like um, every other company out there, do people want to come back to the office and where are they apprehensive about coming back in public? So we, um, you know, we started with, well, come back one day a week and <laughs> see how it goes. And, you know, we had, you know, there's certainly, you know, a percentage of the population that, the, you know, that came back and, hey, this is great. And I'm really happy to come back most of the time. And there were still a number of people that were a little more anxious about coming out in public. Um, you know, we're not faced with like urban areas where you have to deal with with public transit, which is still, you know, creating a little bit of a uh, an issue for people returning to the office. But one of the, you know, but we have seen that the the anxiety once people have gotten into the office, um, you know, the first couple of weeks, there was a lot of sort of like distancing. Um, you know, there were still some people wearing masks. So in, you know, in Michigan, when people moved in was just about the time that the state mandate for mask wearing went away. 
So the timing worked out really well because we were a little, we actually were a little concerned that we were, you know, the space was designed as post COVID. So it was not, not that we were doing anything that would be, you know, considered, you know, a problem. But what we've seen over time is people becoming more comfortable be being around more people. And that, you know, you know, when, you know, when this whole thing hit and people, you can't shake hands, you can't hug, you know, that was the end of all of those, you know, sort of, you know, kind of like interactions. And now what we're seeing is everybody's shaking hands and everybody's hugging. And it's the first time you've seen everybody, you know, somebody back in the office. So we are seeing that camaraderie and that personalization um, really coming back in full force. But it, we're seeing, again, the behaviors slowly adjust um, to pe and it's been more around people being around other people and feel feeling confident because, um, you know, the, the fact that, OK, well, you know, you don't need to wear a mask if you've been vaccinated. But of course, you know, asking people if they're vaccinated is not necessarily a uh you know something that you know we can ask people so i think that there's people have to build that trust because everybody's built you know everybody's gone to online um conversation so all of a sudden now that i see you in person um i'm starting to you know sort of reimagine these relationships and rekindle these friendships and you know we start to see more people talking to more people um which is great and so I think that the social aspect of what work is, is now really starting to come. And so providing these social, um, you know, we refer to these as social hubs, but providing places for the serendipitous act interaction is so critical because now, you know, people want to do, you know, to have those sort of serendipitous connections and providing places for that to happen we're seeing activity in those spaces way more than we ever expected yeah thanks so much rich i am looking forward to a hug i am sure of that um i'm gonna hit it send it over to ann uh to, to finish us off here wow that was fantastic what relevant and applicable information has been shared today and thank you uh, to our audience for your participation and engagement. I'd also like to thank our knowledgeable panelists, Tracy, Fatima, and Rich for sharing their ideas. You know, hybrid is complex, although not unattainable. It is time for us to dip our toe into this exciting time we're entering for work and our work life. We, POI, move into our new space late summer, early fall, and we're planning our next webinar towards the later part of fall to share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our transition into hybrid. Keep an eye out for our invitation. We'd love to see you there. And we'd especially love to see you in our new facility over the next coming months to experience the power of hybrid. Bye for now.